I'm Greg. I'm uh, one of the developers of Gel, and I'm going to be demonstrating a number of things today. Um, basically, going over um, all the new things that I've been working on the last two or three months to let you make voxel worlds in Gel. So there's a lot to show, and I'm going to just go through the process of kind of putting together a world um, here. So, so this is Gel. If you've never used it before, you can check it out at. Um, let me just switch to it. Actually, if you go to Gel.app then it'll load up once you've uh, kind of created your space or if you're already logged in you'll go to the space you were in last time and um, so I'm so gel is kind of set up similarly to say like discord or notion so you have your um, your chat channels on the left and then you have uh, your so this is like a typical chat channel and then you have um, your worlds and so on on the uh, on the left we can create a new world here and it'll just quickly instantly set one up for us and so you can see these worlds are, you know, they're, they have a like nice outdoor environment. You can actually adjust a lot of the settings in the world uh, environment through the environment panel here. So I can change the colors. Let's say I want to have it look like kind of like this. This is more like a, a kind of a dirty terrain with some cool purple trees. Or I can just do like a standard, you know, gra gra green grass, green trees type of uh, environment. And then I can also adjust. Um, uh, the, the sounds and then also the terrain um, but now in, at the bottom of gel this is this is some new stuff I can actually browse a scene library so this is another way to kind of adjust the terrain so I can have a um, I can be in a flat world like this um, or I can be in the island world that we just saw um, and then I can also be in this like cool hilly terrain where it's kind of a mix of the two where there's a bunch of like hills but it's it's not disconnected by water and so, um, and so there's other scenes too. So this is going to be some, kind, of, kind of the stuff I'm going to be showing off uh, today where um, you can actually create a scene that looks kind of like an office environment. And so if I switch to that scene for this world, you can see all these objects are going to pop in and it's going to show um, you know, all kinds of cool stuff that you could possibly make um, yourself. One cool hotkey uh, you can use is if you hit control space, then um, you'll end up uh, going full screen. So you can kind of take a closer look and all the other stuff kind of slides out of the way. And, um, and that lets you kind of see the, um, the content a little bit better. Or if you're talking to somebody, you'll be able to see them a little bit better. So, um, so today I'm going to be going over how you can kind of build this stuff yourself. And so, um, so to start, what I'm going to do is uh, switch us switch the scene for this world back to a, um, a flat open space. It kind of gives me a nice blank canvas. And so I'll, I'll just name this world uh, you know, Greg's office space. And so you know, Gel is um, a pretty open-ended uh, tool for kind of collaborating with people in a spatial uh, medium. And so I'll just kind of go over some of the really basic functionality. So, um, so first is that you know you have these hotkeys in the bottom right, so they're always really helpful to be there in the corner to just help you kind of keep track of all the keystrokes that you could possibly be using. And you know, Gel is very focused on keyboard-oriented um, usage, so a lot of the things you might find in apps that are very focused on getting it so that the user interface is all kind of up in your face while you're using it, Gel kind of takes a different approach where it looks at the keyboard as kind of a critically important part of the uh, user experience. So it does mean that there's a slightly higher learning curve, but it does make it so that the level of efficiency you can have when using the tool is, is quite a bit higher, I would say, um, once you've gotten through that little, that little bit of a learning curve. And so, you know, it's typical uh, first-person shooter controls. You can hold shift to run. In fact, if you hold shift, it'll grab your mouse, so this way you're not like using your cursor anymore. And then, um, and then and, uh, slash will give you an object creation menu. So what I'm going to do here is I have this little dummy object I like to use. It's just a rubber duck, <laughs> and you can create one of those. It's a good way to kind of test out the controls or, um, or, or to demonstrate certain things. And so, so I have this duck here, and it's kind of floating there. If I use my left mouse button to drag around, I can't. I don't really do anything with the duck. I have to use my right mouse button to move it around, or I can um, hover over it and hold Tab too. So that's like for people that are on like a trackpad that don't want to have, that don't have a second easy to use secondary mouse button for dragging. So, um, and so, you know, you can see that when I'm hovering over this, a whole bunch of hotkeys do hop, pop up. So I can, um, I can, you know, hit L to lock it, for example, and now that, that duck is effectively frozen. It's, it's not something that I'll accidentally be able to move. It kind of acts as if it was like part of the world itself. 
and I can hover over it and unlock it too, just with L again. So that's actually something we'll be doing a lot in this in this demonstration because the way you'll build things is you'll you'll kind of bring objects in and then as they get to the point you want them to be, you can lock them so that way you don't accidentally move them again and like kind of opens up the rest of the um, area for you to keep building. And so um, there's a bunch of other commands. So we can um, we can clone the duck by just um, hitting C. And so now these are effectively clones of one another. And um, another way to clone the object, well, I'll go with, now I'll show you how to remove an object. So to remove it, remove it you have to hit X twice, because you just want to make it so that's not easy to do by mistake. Um, and then you can also now uh, hit Control and right drag to, uh, to create another duck. And so, um, and so that's like a nice hotkey to be able to like kind of drag out other objects. Let me see why this not, yeah, it's kind of not working for me right here, I think maybe because of my streaming setup. But um, typically you can drag and then um, and then you'll you'll kind of drag out a copy of the object. That's a kind of common uh, method as well. Um, and then if you if you hold R, you can rotate the object. So you can see I can drag up and down to um, to rotate this little duck here, and I can hold Control. Yeah, my control is not working for some reason, so I'll probably be limited in that in using Control today. But um, and then I can also hold Shift while I'm rotating to do a smooth rotation. So that's kind of how you rotate, and you know that's a good example of the kind of thing where you're not going to have these like on screen. Um, the uh, oh hey John, <laughs> thanks for joining. And so you're not going to have like these on screen icons everywhere. You have to kind of learn that R is how you rotate, and this is very similar to Blender. It just kind of gets a lot of cruft out of the way, like once you once you've got, got your muscle memory. And then the other one is uh, V to scale, so you just scale up and down. Um, pretty basic stuff. You can also hit F to zoom on the object to just get a closer look. And here you can actually see me. Here I am there, my little avatar. And, um, and you can scroll to zoom in and out. And um, if you hit F, you can jump back. And then another handy thing is if you're, you know, if we're rotating this guy and he's getting all kind of messed up, we can hit G to reset, um, reset him so his transforms reset. So now he's like not going to be reoriented in a strange way, and we can try again. Um, so that's the, kind of the core functionality that was in gel before I started working on world building tools. But when you actually want to like do significant content creation, like and build build worlds, there's actually kind of a good amount of other stuff that you really need. So um, so the first thing is that um, you want to be able to to um, to move objects along Y and then also along X and Z. So if I'm dragging this object now, I can actually hold Q, and if I'm holding Q, it'll actually snap it along X Z on a grid. So this is like a really nice way to um, to precisely place objects just along X, Z without accidentally moving them along Y. And then similarly, if I drag, if I'm moving this guy and I hit hold E, it's going to now go back and move him simply along Y. So this is a good way to raise and lower objects. And just like before, I can hold Shift to kind of make it a smooth transition or a grid snap transition. So that's like just basic grid snapping. Um, the grid is actually relative to the scale of the object, and you know, for voxel objects, that makes sense because you know your bigger objects that have bigger voxels, you kind of want to often snap those uh, next to each other, and the smaller objects similarly, like you want them their voxels to line up. So that's kind of how the grid works. And um, the last a, a really really powerful tool is if you are dragging now. I actually put it on space because it's so critical. So if you hold down space, it will snap to. Um, the, the, the nearest surface that you're pointing at, like with your cursor. And so, you know, for example, if I make another duck and I start moving him around, if I point him at this duck while I'm holding space, he's going to snap to the surface of that duck, right? And there are other operations you can actually do while you're holding space there. Um, oh, no, there's no actual way to type in the coordinates just yet, but that's certainly something I'll be looking into. I think Joe is going to eventually probably have a typical properties panel. So, like, if you hit F, you'll most likely get some kind of properties here at some point. So you can actually do things like precise positioning or like modifying the behavior of the object. And so um, that's where that will probably go. But right now you kind of have to eyeball everything, um, which, is, which is not you know, terrible for these voxel objects, but certainly if you're trying to do any kind of layout with like things that aren't very QB like that, you kind of want like much more precise placement. Um, but the grid tends to work pretty good as you'll see. So, um, so if I snap with my space bar as I'm doing this, there's actually other hotkeys that unlock. You can see in the bottom right. So I can actually rotate now uh, with Q and E, 
like a lot while he's snapping to that surface. So that allows me to kind of orient things. Like say for example, um, as you'll see, if I'm snapping to a wall, that allows me to kind of rotate a picture like on the wall so it's not flush perfectly with the floor. And so, um, and then similarly, I can also hit uh, T and G to uh, alter the axis it's gonna, it's gonna snap on. So this allows me to say, um, take a chair that would normally snap along, well maybe that's not a great example, like take a picture frame that might snap typically like along the floor axis or the, the bottom axis of the picture, but I want to snap it up against the wall so it's hanging off the wall. So that allows me to kind of adjust that axis so that it's gonna snap along the axis I prefer. And then if you snap that way, it actually, it actually is sticky. So if I hit T, now my duck is going to continually always snap upside down, right? No matter where I, what I do, I let go of him. It's, it actually sticks even across sessions. So if I come back, it actually gets stored so that this duck is going to be a, a head snapping duck as opposed to like a bottom snapping duck. And so, um, so those combination of controls like allow you to kind of nicely place the, um, the oriented snapped object. And so in conjunction with all the other stuff, you know, you kind of have all the tools you need, I think, to do a reasonable job of laying stuff out. So let's get started. So that's a, that's a really rapid overview of, of the kind of various um, keys and gestures you can do. And I might have missed a few, but those are the core ones. And so, um, so but those will become more, more apparent um, as I build. So I'm gonna just make a little, a little thing like the conference room we saw in the beginning. So there's scenes, right, as, as we've been kind of using before, like you can kind of switch the scene and it just brings in all the objects. And these are scenes I've put together, but soon you'll be able to build your own and, and add your own scenes to this library. But, um, but alongside scenes, we have objects. And so objects are, uh, are, full of, are fully voxelized objects that are editable by you, but were imported um, for you to take advantage of. And so much like the duck, you kind of place them however you want. You can lock them and all that other stuff. So let's start with just laying out some floor tiles. So if we go to floors, you can see if I hover over these, um, you can get a nice little preview and you can you can move your mouse to take a closer look. And so if I, um, <laughs> hey, Dr. Roller <Rollerator. laughs> Um So you can, if you basically go ahead and you can pull, you can drag these in, right? Come on. There we go. I don't know if there's somewhere that was weird. So, um, so now I can pull these in, right? And of course they're not, they're not really lined up, but they are snapping to the, to the ground. So like when I drag them in, they, they end up snapping by default, similar to how it works when you hold down space. So now if I grab it and I hold down space, I start snapping to the grid. And so I can just grab this one, or so do this like this maybe, right? So I can go ahead and put this like this. There we go. And I grab this one, holding space, right? That one. And now if I just want to throw another one up here, I don't have this. I could either drag it in again, or I can always just like hit, hit C, right? So now I got one here, hit C, hit space. And, um, and there we go, right? Oops, get a little bit more correct here. There we go, okay, cool. So now if, I, um, if I'm just hanging out here, right, I could accidentally move these, right? So, oops, I moved it wrong, right? So now what I, I can also do undo, right? So like if I did that, oops, I hit, I hit Control Z. Oh, actually that's broken too, sorry. But you should be able to hit Control Z. <laughs> Let me do that again later, um, just give me a second. That can happen. That's a bug where if you if you actually already renamed the room, the Control Z doesn't um, work because it, it's still focused in there. So let me just refresh so that won't happen again. So Control Z basically walks back through the stack of transforms you've done to any object. So like if you move an object and you hit Control Z, it'll um, it'll undo that last move or that last rotate or that last scale. So if I um, now do this again, right? Let's say I like place this, right? And now it, I like accidentally move it. Um, what I can do is hit Control Z, and then it'll pop it back to where it was. Okay, so now um, I have these four tiles here, but I don't want to accidentally move these again, right? I want to start working on stuff on here. So I just go through them all and hit L and lock them. Now, like, even if I right drag, it has no effect. They're effectively boxed in. And in fact, when they're locked, I actually will walk on them. So, like, it's not obvious because these are very thin right now, but let me just show you, for example, if I, um, if I throw like a beanbag chair in here, right? Let's make this like really big beanbag chair and just like kind of place it here. If I, if I hover over this, um, or sorry, if I walk around right now, I walk through this because it's like not locked. But if I lock it, now what will happen is I'll actually walk up and over it. So it kind of turns the object into being part of the, um, 
into being part of the, part of the environment, so to speak, so that people will not um, walk through these things. Um, and, and it also ends up making it so that these are like physical, um, here, I'll do my, um, my happy kiss emoji here. It also makes it so these actually have collision too. So like if I, um, if I shoot at it when it's locked, it'll, it'll kind of fall, it'll like collide with it. But if I shoot at it when it's not locked, it ends up kind of popping and almost like an action. Like I haven't really done anything with that yet, but the idea is like if it's not locked, it's kind of considered to be like media that people are like sharing and like, or objects that they're kind of temporarily keeping around to demonstrate them or something. And so um, what, when it's locked, it's kind of part of the environment. So like you actually want it to just kind of flow over the flow over it in that sense. Um, can I link multiple objects to enable acting on a single element? No, right, so right now I haven't implemented any kind of grouping thing. There's kind of like a whole rabbit hole with regards to those kinds of functionalities because I, I don't even have the idea of like selection right now. So you don't ever select anything in gel, you just hover over it and then use hotkeys to interact with it. And so to actually um, do things like say grouping objects or like moving objects together like as a set, like I would need to expand this to include selection. And so it could certainly happen. I think right now, like, you know, I've, I found that the current tool set is fairly capable with regards to building stuff. And so it's always a matter of asking like, where's the best place to keep pushing. And right now I kind of feel like everything in here is kind of going to be mostly where it's going to stay for a little while while I kind of switch on to other stuff. But, um, but you know, certainly if people come along and like they're really struggling because of that, uh, over that, that missing piece, I could, I could revisit that. So, um, so I'm going to remove that chair. And so the library here right now is, is, is this kind of serious business um, uh, kit, which is really a little bit uh, ridiculous given that I'm like actually not a huge fan of these like virtual conference spaces that typically are being made. But it does seem to be something that people wanted. So for me, like that kind of was the thing I started with. But I'm, you know, I'm planning on adding a lot more stuff here. So there's, there's some... Um, commercial assets that I've been like voxelizing to bring in, you know, like this. And so this was just the low hanging fruit in terms of like being able to make things that people will be, I think, most likely to like look at and be like, oh, that looks like something that could be fun. And so, um, but I want to have more zany stuff in here, like, you know, fantasy worlds and sci-fi and all this other stuff and have all the relevant kits for you to build those kinds of things too. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Gator. And so, um, and so, so to build this little room, I'm going to just do a few more of these tiles, right? And I'm doing this on the fly. So like I, I kind of built this conference room before, but like at the same time, like I can't promise this is going to actually turn out great because, um, you know, I'm not really an artist and like I kind of just throw things together. I kind of leave that to other people to do <laughs> and do a better job. But I do want to show off these things because I feel like people are going to really get a lot out of them. So, okay. So now I'm going to lock these guys and, um, and then I'm going to bring in, now we're going to do the walls, right? So the walls are going to be like pretty, um, pretty simple here. So there's a lot of wall tiles I have in here. So some of them have windows, some of them have doorways, some of them are just plain, up, plain windows that you can slap onto things. Um, you know, I'm not an architect at all. So like, I'm sure my, um, my stuff I've been doing with this is not extremely sound from an architectural point of view, but you know, you can kind of get the idea. So I'll just throw this wall here. And then, you know, clone it here. Oops. And then, you know, so you can see I'm rotating it around, right? So that, that way it's facing the right way. And then we just lock these, right? And now if I'm, if I'm shooting at it again, like it should kind of bounce off the wall, right? If it's stuck to the wall, if it's kind of screwing up the collision, it's not perfect because it's, it's computing like a convex hull right now for these. So the convex hull probably isn't that great, but if these were a little bit bigger, it would, it would act a little differently. Um, and so now we can go and like throw a screen up here, right? So um, or I put this in, a board, in boards. These are like, these are objects that you we typically snap to a wall or like we have a whiteboard, kind of a one-off standalone whiteboard. So if I grab this and I point it at the, um, at the wall, it's kind of pre-configured to snap to vertical surfaces like this. So that's kind of making it nice and easy. And then, um, you know, I have tables so I can go in grab a nice cool conference table, all right, there we go. And uh, might wanna make this like a little bit bigger. So like, let's scale it up. And then um, there's that. That's actually a little too big, I think. Whoops. Okay. And see, you see I kind of like screwed up and got it crooked here and I like maybe decided I don't want it crooked. I can just hit like G 
G on that to reset it and just get it back to a normal transform and then do a full 90 degree turn. Um, okay, cool. So now I'll lock this. Oh, and by the way, Gator, speaking of throwing digital money, I don't know if this is what you were getting at. Uh, let's see. Here we go. This is actually a feature. Check that out. How ridiculously cool is that? <laughs> um, so, and in fact, let me just show you one more thing. Yeah, there we go. Now we're talking. All right. So, uh, I can add some chairs too if we want for like decoration. And this is not exactly a, a very good conference room chair, but you get the idea. And then, you know, gel also supports like any kind of media that you can pull in it that you would want, right? So you can bring in 3D models, you can bring in images, you can actually paste YouTube videos. So I'll just upload an image here of, uh, here's this like app icon, right? So this is just a straight up PNG off my computer. And, um, and I can just slap that up here if I want, right? And you know, a lot of the media functionality was, was inherited from Hubs, obviously, for anyone that might be following what I've been doing. But, um, but it's all got support for GLB, it's got support for you know, video stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, and so that's, like, that's kind of giving you a pretty good overview, I think, of like how you would build stuff. So like, you know, the scenes I have are, we can actually pop into a, a more sophisticated one here. This took me about like an hour to do, maybe less than an hour, maybe like half an hour. Um, and this is just switching the scene for this world. So it actually is going to retain the stuff I built. So I built some stuff in this world already, but when I switch the scene, it ends up like importing all the other crap too. So let me see. So here's, here's the stuff I was working on. It just so happens that it's like not, it's not in the same coordinate space as the stuff that was in the scene. Um, but you can see like I don't lose my work or anything. I just basically brought in all this other junk that took a little bit more time to lay out, but it's like very much the same approach. So I just, you know, laid out the walls, laid out the floor tiles, brought in a bunch of props, brought in a bunch of like um, furniture. You know, these kitchen things are all kind of individual objects. Like I can take this and show you, like if I grab this, it's just kind of like there. Um, and then, you know, placing stuff on the, on the table is real easy. You just like take this donut, clone it, move it there. You can even stack, start stacking them, right? Like here's a donut on top of a donut, and then a, a third donut there. And so this is kind of showing you all the object level um, arranging tools and like the library and all that. But there's actually a whole other layer to gel that I haven't shown off yet, right? So um, you might be wondering like, okay, why are all these things so like voxely? Like why, why is this like this? And it's not really just an art style thing. Like the art style is cool, but it's also like an intentionally designed thing where I wanted to make it so that, you know, you could actually start really editing these in gel. And that's all, that's all here. So, um, before I show that, I just want to note that um, if you upload a, um, a 3D model, I can actually go to um, my, um, my computer and grab a Vox file. So I can actually upload a Vox file um, like this castle. So if you've already made some voxel content like in Magical Voxel, it just imports automatically, right? Um, but it's not just a 3D model, right? So that's kind of what I'm going to get to now is gel in addition to all these you know object library and arrangement tools and world uh customization it also has a fully featured multiplayer voxel editing system and so um and so to just jump right to that so i'm going to collapse this so we can see a little better and in the bottom here there's this little button build right so what this is going to do is i'm going to collapse the hotkeys too just to make it a little bit less noisy oh and you probably can't see that actually so let me just um just show in the corner here. So here's where it looks, here's where it is, right? So if you switch to build, um, you can also hit control B. Now what you get is, um, let me just see if I can move this video a little bit. There we go. Okay, look at that magic. And so, um, and so now you can see the panel a little bit better. And so when you're in build mode, gel actually operates almost like magic, like much like magic of Oxel, except it's now a multiplayer magic of Oxel. So if like somebody else was in here, they would actually be able to build this, work on this object with me. <coughs> also when you're build in build mode, the controls change a little bit. So 
I can still do WSD to move around, but I can also use W and E to kind of fly around. So when you're in build mode, it's kind of presumed that you like want to be able to get the best vantage point of certain things and you're not kind of participating like as if it's a game or a hangout space together. And so flying around is like kind of to fly around, you, you have to go into build mode. Certainly I'm sure people will go into build mode just to fly around because people often like to do fly, like flying around, but like having it be not in build mode kind of makes it so that um, the default behavior will be you're kind of be stuck to the floor and walking over things that were locked and things like that. And so, um, and so now we're in this editing mode. And so, you know, I can give a really quick lightning tutorial of like Magic of Voxel, um, at least the parts that I've kind of lifted into gel. And so there's six tools and then each tool um, has different modes it can be in. Typically it's just attach, erase, or paint. And so attach just means adding voxels. So right now I'm in the V and the V is just a voxel brush. So it's just effectively a brush that like adds voxels like while you stroke with your mouse, right? And so, um, and so to, to use the brush, I either hold space or I uh, hold the middle mouse button. And so you can see, I can just like stroke voxels onto this, right? And it's gonna use the color in my palette that I've selected. So I can like now use this color, stroke voxels here, or I can um, go to, and then I have pages in the palette. So I can like go to this one and I can customize the palette too. So like I can click this, I can change this to here. And now it'll be that color. Um, I can also do little things like, this is also kind of similar to Magic of Voxels. So if I hover over here, there's some little extra hotkeys I can do. So like say I wanted to create a little palette that was like a gradient from like light green to dark green. Like I could, um, I could change this to, um, to like a, a light green and then change this to a darker, darker green. And then I can actually click on this and drag with Alt. And now it'll make this nice little gradient for me. So now I can start like drawing like you know some green voxels here some slightly darker green voxels over here right and so it lets me kind of do this nice vo voxel art styling by having these gradients you can also hit control to copy and, and, and duplicate colors too um, and then there are these pages right and I also have a reset button um, so that like you know if I have this palette here I made these like I made these like nice default palettes that are like kind of hitting every major primary color and then having a nice gradient on them and, but if like I come in here and I like start messing around, sometimes I might want to actually just get back those purples because they were kind of handy. So I can just hit that and I'll get the purples back. It'll, it'll, it'll lose what I had. Um, um, and you know, another nice thing is if I hold alt and then I hit uh, my mouse button, that actually is like an eyedropper. So I can either do the eyedropper by like clicking this and eyedropping or I can just hold alt. And this is also taken from Magic of Voxel. So if I hold alt, I don't have to worry about like losing colors per se because I can just pull them back out of the object that I'm working on. Um, we'll also notice that like there's no working object per se. Like the reason that it's not painting on these is because they're locked. So if I like unlock this one, you can see I'm just equally able to to, to, to work on this one too, right? There it goes. Um, and then I can just switch right back here. So these objects are independent, but like the brushing and the, and the tooling is all integrated. Um, oh, awesome. That's really, I hope I look forward to seeing that Anthony. I think that'd be really cool. And so, um, and so this voxel brush is just one brush. Um, I can just show off a little bit more of that and then move on to the other ones. But if you, um, if you do a race, that's kind of self-evident what it does. It gets rid of the voxels you brush, right? You can see I'm getting rid of stuff. And then paint uh, replaces the color, right? So like see, I'm not actually adding voxels. It might be a little hard to tell, but like right here, you can see like, I'm just gonna paint a line, right? And that is not replacing, that is not adding voxels to the, to the object, but, but, but painting them in the color. Um, you can also do mirroring. So like this will mirror along X, Y, and Z. So like if I do that, you can see it like I'm, I'm actually gonna brush along multiple axes. You can see I ended up painting. Here we go, this is a little easier to see on this side. Um, so you can see like I can just paint. And then, um, and you can do it, you can actually increase the brush size. So this is actually kind of a cool effect. So if I increase the brush size to five and then I make it attach and let's just make it purple. You can see it's like this cool round brush. Um, let me turn off the options too. So I can like paint like these kind of blobby things. And then in conjunction with like painting, you can kind of really quickly get something kind of cool. Um, Cause you're now painting like a bigger thing. And so, um, so, you know, I've got this object and I just kind of did all this voxel work in gel and it's all collaborative. So if somebody else was here, they could also be doing this right next to me, which is really cool, I think. And, um, and then, 
before I go into the other brushes, I'll also show you. So I'm doing this like in world, which is like certainly good in certain cases. Like it's pretty flexible actually, because you can fly around. But if I hover over this, um, I can actually hit tilde to get it into a more traditional 3D editor style um, viewport, right? So this makes it like the camera controls are a little bit better. Like I can, um, I can use my middle mouse button to pan, I can scroll, I can um, orbit with the right mouse button. And now my left mouse button is the thing that paints as opposed to like my middle mouse button or the space bar, which is like kind of more common in a painting tool. You want to use your left mouse button, right? And so that's kind of trying to, this is more making it similar to like a, vox, a magical voxel editor tool. You can also go into ortho, which sometimes people making voxel art want to use orthographic cameras because you know, it's a very blocky type of art style. So like, you really want to get a sense that things are lined up the way you want. Um, you can have this little floor there or not, which is nice for like painting stuff on the bottom. And then the other kind of crazy thing is like, you might think this is like a separate view, but what it actually is doing is it's, it's masking out the world, which is kind of a cool little trick. So like, even if I go to orthographic, you know, I can see it's like just hiding the world to make it almost like lie to me that it's in a separate editor. But it does mean like other people could be painting on this while I'm sitting here in this editor view and it'll, it'll appear. Um, so that pops me back out. And so, you know, all of these objects I brought in, uh, obviously, are, are these kinds of objects. So like I can take, I can go over to this cup and if I unlock it, I can, I can start editing it, right? So I can just hit tilde if I want to um, get a closer look. And now I can start painting on this. Um, like let's make it a cool, like kind of sp spotted cup. And then I can like add this, All right? If you couldn't tell, I'm not an artist. And so now I've got this cup. What um, what might not be obvious is that since I brought these in originally from the library, um, these were like actually just the original library versions of them. So like, what I mean by that is like by editing this. I didn't actually edit the library. Like that would be really bad if somebody could just like grab an object out of the library and start editing it. Um, uh, oh yes, I'll show that, John. Um, but you know, it actually ends up making a copy for me. As soon as I start editing this object, it actually forked the object into my own copy that now is like mine and eventually will show up in my library as a custom version of the cup that I made for myself. But um, it doesn't affect the underlying library. So I can go back and pull another cup from the original library and it'll be distinct. Um, so let me just show the brushes really quick because that was what I was going to go over next. So we have the V brush, which I already showed you, right? You kind of need to know these top three pretty well to I think do a decent job of modeling. So the brush is very straightforward. Um, the F brush is, is the face brush. And so what the face, br face brush does is it operates on an entire face. And so, um, and so if I want to like, so if I'm, if I'm doing the face brush and I'm attaching, right? And then these options determine like what it does to determine what a face is, like what is a connected, connected face. So like, here's a, here's a good example, right? So the top of this cup, right, has these voxels here, okay? And so now I have it set to geometry, which means it's gonna grab, it's gonna consider the face I click on to be all the flat geometry that's connected geometrically to, um, to where I clicked, right? So if I, if I now click and drag, it's gonna pull that face out, okay? And so, um, I can undo actually also with Alt Z in with the voxels. So Control Z undo, undoes my object transforms, and Alt Z undoes my voxel transforms. And all these hotkeys are actually available in the um, editor. If you're if you're looking at the editor, um, you can see them. And um, yeah, and so you know, so I'm I'm kind of pulling it out, you know, based on the geometry, right? Because it's like it's crawling the voxel mesh and deciding like, okay, all these are flat connected, but I can also base it on color, right? So that kind of further constrains it. So now it's going to pull everything that's geometrically connected that also has the same color. And so if I change this to green just to make it a little more clear, right? If I pull this out now, you can see it's not pulling out those white, right? Because those are not part of the same face according to this once it's in color mode. And I can also set it to use the existing color. So this will now ignore my palette and it will just let me pull faces and maintain their color, right? So it's kind of cool. And then, um, and then this is a little bit of a power user feature, but this basically determines when it crawls the, the voxel mesh to determine the, um, the face. It can either walk only like north, south, east, and west. So it's gonna like not crawl diagonals. Um, 
And if it's set to eight, it'll crawl diagonal. So like if there was another piece of voxel, like I guess, let me just do it really quick. If I like attach another piece, like if I attach another little piece of voxel right here, then that guy, if it's set to eight, will actually be considered part of the same face. And so, um, and so if I um, pull this out, you can see it's pulling it out too, right? But if I set it to um, back to four, now it's not going to consider that guy part of it. So that's the face brush. That's an extremely powerful tool, and that's that's if it's, you're going to attach, right? If you're going to attach, it'll 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 pull. If you're going to erase, it'll push, and it'll erase, right? So I can see I can erase these these faces, right? Um, and then paint, kind of obviously paint, right? It'll paint the whole face. So there's no pulling or pushing with that. It's just going to paint the whole face. So if I just do this, right, you can see I can paint faces. And again, like if I set it to, to be color, it's going to paint but constrain on the color. So I can just paint these if I had it in color. It's going to ignore the white because they're not the same color. Um, so now to answer your question, John, I'll jump right ahead to the fill. So the fill is kind of the more basic thing. It's like a kind of like a, an Uber uh, fill for that doesn't just stick to the single face. And so what it does, it, um, it'll it walk every adjacent voxel either across four or eight, across the whole mesh, and then fill it. So if I <clears throat> if I have it on Geo, it's going to just fill the whole cup, right? Because it's, it's not caring about color. But if there was another piece of voxel like over here, um, I'll just like go ahead and make some, right? If there, was, if there was some like over here, it's kind of obvious, but like it's not connected. So like if I go to this fill thing, it's not going to fill that in, right? It's going to just fill the connected part. And now if I switch it to color, it's going to fill in just the adjacent color. It's going to skip over crawling everything else that's a different color. Um, that's a good question. So the file size, um, well, when, it, when, these are in, when, when these are in gel, they're not really in the form of a file per se. They're like in a data structure in a database. Um, if you were to export this to Vox, you know, I think um, Vox, Vox files are are not um, especially compact because of the way the file is laid out. Um, so they don't really like compress things. Whereas with gel, I wrote like a kind of semi-custom compression algorithm. So like the actual in-memory uh, uh, storage for the voxel meshes is like relatively minor compared to like a what you'd see if it was exported to a box file. So it ends up, it does a like run length encoding on the, um, or is it really? No, it does like palette-based compression. So like. It'll just store like if this if this voxel has like three colors, it'll only store like two bits for each voxel, um, and then it just stores them in a compact grid um, in, a, in memory. So I don't know if that helps answer your question, but if there's kind of thinking behind like what you want to think about the size for, then I can maybe give a better answer. Um, so that's the fill brush. the The B is the um, is the box brush. So this is also a very helpful and you know critically useful brush. This is like if you want to like add voxels that, that are in the shape of a box. So it's it's very useful for like adding layers of voxels like this. And then similarly, it's also very useful for like carving out um, chunks of, of voxels. So you can see like when I drag, it's basically it's basically drawing a box between like where I start my drag and like where I, I release my drag um, based on the ray cast of both sides. So like it can actually, it's actually a three dimensional box. It's not like a, a 2D rectangle. And so you can see I just carved out like this um, this box sized hole in the, in the in the coffee cup, and so that's what the box brush does. And this is like actually like a really common thing to do is like if you take the B and then you um, and then you like attach a really quick way to like create like a cube is like you first box brush out like a um, you you just box brush out like a surface like this. And then, and then you can extrude it with the face brush. So if I switch to the face brush, um, then I can pull it up, right? And now I've got this nice little cube. And then I can start like carving it out. I can like go to erase. By the way, there's also all hotkeys for all these. So like I'll start using those now, but like basically um, you can see I can start carving, right? And then I can hit Alt G to like switch to paint and Alt V to do the uh, voxel brush and I can start painting this. And so now we've got this like, you know, hacked up coffee cup that has all my new stuff. Um, and that was like a whirlwind tour, but you know, you can see it's pretty capable in terms of being able to actually model things and like paint them and have a palette and all that stuff. I tried to get to the point where like I was fairly convinced that 
uh, a proficient Magic of Oxal user should be able to come in here and actually like make reasonably good stuff. Like there's a there's still a ton of stuff I could do that like you know obviously Magic of Oxal is a much more feature filled app. And there's like some pretty critical things like being able to select voxels, being able to copy paste chunks of voxels, like all that stuff I punted on. But like the core brushes, I kind of tried to do my best to get it very close to what they had in Magic of Voxel. And then the palette as well is like critically important because you know you need to be able to work with colors very quickly. Um, so so those were the two things I really focused on. And so um, so that shows off the uh, the editor aspect. And so now if I switch out of build mode, now I'm back in my normal mode. And these are just like, you know, objects for me to deal with. And there's no more brushing stuff happening when I'm hovering over them. Um, and the other thing I want to just show really quick is when you hit um, when you hit C, right? If I make another one of these, make it a little bit bigger, right? Oops, there's my, there's my dollar bills. If I make it a little bit bigger um, and make a few of them. These are all instanced. So like when I hit C, these are actually instanced meshes. So from a technical stand, standpoint, they actually only take one draw call to draw all three because they have the same mesh and like basically it can know that because I hit use the C command to do it. But the interesting thing is that um, since they're instances, like if I start working on one of these, you'll you'll see like in real time, like they'll actually all update, right? So like I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Right? And so you can see all of them are like actually responding to my brush, right? Which is kind of cool. And so if I go over to like this wall, um, I don't know which ones have the same tiles, but like, oh, they're all locked, so it's a little bit hard to do. But you know, you can imagine like, if I had a bunch of wall tiles, then you know, if I paint on one, it'll affect all of them in the whole room. So it's kind of a nice uh, thing to keep in mind. And you know, that's actually not always what you want, right? So like, if I have this cup and like I want to make actually a new one, the other hotkey to use is um, is bake. So it's, it's you can't see it here, but it's, it's in the list, and it's bake. And what that'll do is it'll, it'll actually fork it. So now if I um, now if I paint on this one, you can see it's not it's not taken into account, but um, the other ones are not taken into account. And so like you don't want to probably bake unless you have to because it's like cheaper for it to render the stuff that's all instanced, like I said. So um, so all this kind of fed like all of this work like really fed into the idea that like I really wanted to get to the point where like this kind of room, right? Like all these tiles, all these wall tiles, this floor tiles, like these chairs. If I had a bunch of them, like if I had it, like you know, a ton of these things. Like, it's not really adding, it's adding some cost, obviously, but it's not adding draw calls, which is like really, really important. So, um, you know, the draw calls for this aren't, aren't stellar, right? I mean, it's not like the kind of thing where I feel like this is gonna run fantastic in a VR headset right now, but um, nonetheless, like it does run reasonably okay on like a lower end computer. It's, it's, it's definitely more within the boundaries. Like I think right now it's like, to do all this stuff, is like um, on the order of like 200 draw calls, which like isn't nothing, but it's also like not the end of the world. Whereas if it wasn't instancing all of these, you would you know see that bump up quite a bit. And um, there's a lot more I can do, but like fundamentally, I wanted to build to build something that like you know from the ground up would be able to have a reasonable uh, rendering pipeline for like this kind of content um, and still be like fully editable and so on. So so that's kind of um, that's kind of everything I wanted to cover. So we sort of review, right? I mean, we have from the from the beginning, right? We have these these scenes, and these are just composed templates of, of these objects, right? And so soon I'm going to make it so you can publish your own, um, kind of like how we have scenes with Mozilla Hubs that you could publish from Spoke. Well, with with Gel, you'll you'll build the scenes and you'll publish the scenes uh, from within Gel, and um, and then they'll be able to show up here and you'll be able to share your scenes like within your space. So like if people are in the same space as you, which is like this whole thing, not the world, but the space, uh, like the Discord server analog, then they'll have access to all the scenes that you've published or anyone in the space has published. And then certainly one day, maybe I'll be able to curate those and, and have them be publicly available for people too. Um, and then the scenes are composed into objects. The objects, we kind of went over all the placement tools, um, all the ability to kind of scale and rotate and manipulate. Um, and then all the in you know game voxel editing tools as well, and you know it, it, it kind of I've mentioned it before, but like everything you've seen here is fully multiplayer and fully real time. So like if there were other people in this room, like we would all be able to do everything I just did like together in real time, and like it's hard to do to demonstrate that on a Twitch stream, obviously, but like all of this is true, and everything in gel, like everything I built in this, 
I've always built it with that approach. So like everything from renaming the room, like you'll see that happen in real time. Uh, if you create a text field, like if I go and throw this up on the wall and like start typing on it, um, you know, another person will be able to collaboratively um, work on the text field with me in this editor. Like we'll both be sharing the editor. And similarly, like with the voxel editor, we're both able to collaborate where like we each see each other's brush strokes and all that. So, um, so all of that is kind of a cross-cutting design uh, thing I, I tried to make sure was the case. Like I don't like the idea of having people um, having to like go into some kind of like editor mode that like other pe that boxes other people out. So like that's why I kind of made it so it was like in world editor.